Hey everyone and welcome back to the channel. And in today's video we visit Bernard Castle. The castle, not the town, although they share the same name, is one of the most historic castles in the north of England. It has been fought over, won and lost by some of the most famous figures in English history. It has also been claimed by nobles, bishops and kings. It occupies a naturally defensive site, overlooking the wooded gorge of the River Tees. The romantic ruins of the castle are a reminder of the importance and power of the North in medieval times. So let's take a wonder and delve into the history of the castle. After walking through the quiet orchard and the castle's sensory garden, we have a look at some of the flowers that are planted ready for the summer and we make our way across to the now modern bridge between the town ward and the middle ward. It replaces the original bridge that once stood here. It's here that you get to really see and visualise this once great fortress. The land now occupied by the castle was owned by the church as early as the 9th century, but in the 11th century the earls of Northumberland seized it. The earls then rebelled unsuccessfully against William II and the crown seized the land, and in 1095 granted it to Guy de Balliol. The church argued that William had no right to grant the land, and this dispute over ownership simmered on and off for centuries. Guy de Balliol did not hesitate, and shortly after taking possession of the land, he began construction of a ringwork defence that now forms the inner ward. In 1125, his son Bernard rebuilt and expanded the original wooden structure. Bernard also founded the town outside the castle walls and granted it a charter. Later, members of the Balliol family fell on hard times, and this was possibly due to the expense of maintaining the castle. And in 1190, the bishops of Durham held the castle as security for the loan to the current Balliol owner. And later, in 1212, King John ordered the castle to be returned to the Balliols. Heading across to the southwest of the Middle Ward are the stunning remains of the Constable's Tower. This substantial gatehouse that once controlled the entry from the Outer Ward. The keeper of the tower was the principal official of the castle and was always in charge when the Lord was absent. He would have lodged here in the tower with fantastic vantage points to control admission. The constable would have more than likely been a member of the nobility to the Lord for his important work. The plan of the tower was essentially in a rectangular shape with a central gate passageway and it had three storeys with two barrel vaulted ground floor rooms which were entered via the gate passage. From here we walk over the Great Ditch and into the Inner Ward, but not before taking a look at the stunning viewpoint from here. The views really make this castle stand out, with the dramatic sight of the castle perched on the side, overlooking the River Tees. The castle is such a picturesque place to see and enjoy. After enjoying the sights, we head inside the castle's Inner Ward. Back in the 12th century, we would have entered via another gatehouse, this one would have been made from timber before being rebuilt in stone and at a later date with a stone wall added to enclose the ward.
but now as we wander the remains, the first outline we see is from the West Range. This is part of the castle that was unexcavated, but they have documented that they are from the 14th century. It seems to have contained a number of offices and apartment buildings, as well as the kitchens, which were probably at its north end. It's thought that from here in these kitchens, the food would have been taken to a servant hatch in the southeast wall of the Mortem Tower, where it would have been conveyed to the Great Hall, keeping it under cover and hidden. Adjoining the Mortem Tower on the left and the remains of the 14th century Grand Hall, we make our way up to see an overview of the Great Chamber. It was on the first floor here, and its only real architectural feature that still survives is the incredible oriel window in the outer wall. This is dated back to the term when Richard III lived here. His heraldic symbol of a wild boar is carved into the underside of the lintel. There was also a grand fireplace on the first floor, which was directly above the fireplace on the ground floor. This then leads directly into the round tower, where we're able to walk inside and above the two buildings that have been integrated together. The tower is at the northwest end and forms part of the curtain wall. It rises to four storeys, mostly cylindrical, with a single store annex to the southeast. We make our way up the service stairs, and from the top you can see the various staircases, the windows, and the fireplace, which all suggests residential sleeping quarters. In 1216, the Scots under Alexander I invaded the north of England and besieged Bernard Castle briefly. A defender within the castle fired a crossbow bolt that killed Alexander's brother-in-law. The castle survived that siege, but in 1264 it was taken by barons supporting Simon de Montfort's rebellion against Henry III. John de Balliol succeeded in 1228, and he became one of the richest men in England when he married Dervaguilla of Galloway. John was a stern character, and he kept his wife's illegitimate brother, Thomas, imprisoned in Bernard Castle for over 60 years in order to hold his Scottish lands. When John died in 1269, Dervaguilla founded Sweetheart Abbey in his honour. She had also had John's heart embalmed in a casket, which she kept with her, and at mealtimes food was served as if John was present but his portion was given to the poor afterwards. One of John Balliol's sons, also named John, became a claimant to the vacant crown of Scotland. Edward I was called in to adjudicate amongst the various claimants and selected John as the rightful king. As soon as John ascended the throne of Scotland, he forswore his allegiance to Edward, with the result that Edward invaded Scotland, seized John and threw him in the Tower of London. The bishops made another attempt to seize the castle in 1440, when Bishop Neville occupied the site. But the king forced him to return it to the Beauchamps. After the Beauchamp line in the north died out, the castle was granted to Anne, the wife of Richard Neville, the Earl of Warwick. Neville is known in history as the Kingmaker. And after Neville's death in 1471, 
the bishops once more claim the castle, but it was granted to Richard, the Duke of Gloucester, who was later Richard III. When Richard became king, he made great plans to enlarge and strengthen the castle, but his brief reign was brought to an end by defeat at the Battle of Bosworth in 1485. The castle remained in royal hands following his death. In 1569, the castle was at the heart of events in the so-called Rising of the North, a rebellion that sought to remove Elizabeth I in favour of Mary, the Queen of Scots. The castle was besieged by 5,000 rebels, but the commander of the defences, Sir George Bowes, organised a stern defence. The rebels took on the outer ward and the town ward, and Bowes was forced to surrender. But the delay in taking the castle meant that the rebellion was doomed, and it ended shortly after. In 1630, the castle was sold to Sir Henry Vane, who dismantled many of the castle's buildings, to use the stone for rebuilding his main home at Raby Castle. A descendant, Lord Bernard of Raby, gave the castle to the crown, and it is now in the care of the English heritage. Just east of the Round Tower, is the 13th century Poston Tower, which mostly still survives today. It is just two storeys high with angled corners, and its main use was to provide access through the sally port to the outside of the inner ward walls. Just further south of these rooms and walls were the prison tower and the bakehouse. Life in the mid-19th century included a moment to meet someone who was known as a local hermit. His name was Frank Shields, who lived in the castle keep and entertained tourists both as a guide and a personality. For unknown reasons, Frank took up residence in the castle, and by 1851 he was able to give his address as the keep of Castle Bernard, and his occupation as recluse and artist in painting. He had become the hermit of the castle, his passions were of old buildings, and he soon became a master in the history of the castle. The final building that we visit is named the Breckenbury Tower, a two-storey tower that took its name from a servant of Richard III, Sir Robert Breckenbury, who lived in Denton, just 10 miles from Bernard, and was Lieutenant of the Tower of London during the reign of Richard. The barrel-vaulted basement would have more than likely been entered from the courtyard and was lit by a single loop high in the curtain wall. Two doorways are at the west ends of the north and south walls and would have given access to a latrine and a staircase which would have led on to the upper floor. On the first floor was a single chamber equipped with a fireplace and a latrine, given suggestions that this room was used for domestic and residential purposes only. The castle during the day seems like the perfect place to visit and enjoy a picnic and wonder the remains but at night is this place haunted. There have been reports and EPVs hearing agonised screams and cries, and sightings of a woman in white. Could this be some of the soldiers choosing to jump for their lives over the castle walls during the siege when the castle was captured? Or was it Lady Anne Day, a lady said to have lived here during the 16th century, but being thrown from the castle's walls into the raging river below? Either way, you know we love the stories, and hope you do too. A visit to Bernard is a fantastic one. We honestly couldn't recommend this castle more highly. The views, the atmosphere, the history that lived and fought here, and the surroundings are just wonderful and worth a visit, if not for the castle, but for the town and the surrounding walks too. So if you've enjoyed our explore today, please be sure to hit that like button. Consider subscribing to the channel or even becoming one of our channel members or Patreons to see exclusive posts and have your say in where we visit next. We'd like to say a big thank you to our channel members and our Patreons for all of their support. So we'll see you in the next one. Till next time.